Russia is defined by its geography. Size is its most distinctive trait, a trait that is both an advantage and a liability. Much of its territory is indefensible. There are no mountains, oceans or deserts separating the Russian demographic core from its rivals. Sure, Russia has buffer spaces in all directions, but keeping a tab on a nation spanning 11 time zones and nearly 200 ethnic minorities requires more than just buffer space. Holding the Russian geography together from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok necessitates either wealth or force. But since the Russian economy has always been inadequate, force is the prevailing choice. By its very nature, the size of the Russian standing army and intelligence apparatus has to match the size of its territory. And this story of how the Russian government machinery evolved also explains why it cannot become a democratic state in its current territorial configuration. Despotism, it seems, is embedded into the Russian geography. And it is the unforgiving power of geography that determines the character and virtues of a people, or lack thereof. Today's video is sponsored by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Play more than 2000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. I appreciate the manner in which the combined arms is played out, the way air, ground and naval vehicles interact with one another. Every vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled, offering highly immersive combat experience. War Thunder has incredible graphics and detail in 4K resolution to create the immersion you need. Play War Thunder now on PC, PlayStation or Xbox using the link on the screen. Upon registration, you will get a large free bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, premium account, boosters and much more. Life was tough in the 14th century, especially in the proximity of Muscovy. There were only two items that were commercially viable for trade, slaves and fur. But the Mongol conquest of Kivan Rus cut Muscovy off from the Mediterranean slave market, leaving fur as the sole export commodity available. So, to dominate the fur trade, Muscovy expanded north. But these expansions were not hostile takeovers. Rather, the Muscovites lobbied their envoys into the courts of the neighboring provinces, forming coalition offices that were later diplomatically annexed. It was a soft power policy that took well over a century to take shape. Slowly but assuredly, the medieval cities of Pskov, Novgorod, Smolensk, Vyazma, Rzhev, Mazaysk, Tver, Kolomna, Rizan, Murom, Rostov, Vladimir, Yaroslavl, Nizhny Novgorod, Vologda, Kalic, Vyatka, Ustuk and Salikamsk all fell in line. Maps old and new alike do this soft power expansion no justice because the homogeneous colors imply a homogeneous domain with standardized regulations. But medieval kingdoms were more like conglomerates of diverse territories and that's what Muscovy was. In 1480, after integrating the last nearby Slavic realms, Muscovy turned its focus on the fertile lands to the south, which was ruled by the Golden Horde. Fur was a valuable commodity, but to grow in size and strength to seal Muscovy as a powerhouse, agriculture was needed. Slavic farmers needed to settle in the fertile farmlands south of the Oka River. To accomplish that, Muscovy needed to oust the Golden Horde. After back and forth hostilities, the Golden Horde fell to infighting. Several new kingdoms emerged in its place, including Kazan, Astrakhan, Crimea and Sibir. Muscovite envoys acted quickly and lobbied into the courts of the Tatar kingdoms. Over the next decades, the Muscovites gained influence within the Tatar courts. Muscovy slowly eroded their sovereign powers, appointed regents and magistrates and chipped away at their strategic defenses until finally deciding to abolish their self-rule and massacre the civilian populations. By conquering the Tatar kingdom of Kazan in 1552, Muscovy transformed into a fully-fledged empire. 
along with all its responsibilities. Kazan was situated near the confluence of the Volga and Kama rivers. So by controlling Kazan, Moscovy was able to expand down the Volga river towards the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and up the Kama river to the Ural mountains. However, as Moscovy transformed into Russia, the power of the monarchy was centralized. This came at a tremendous cost to the civilian population. To keep tabs on the nobility, Tsar Ivan the Terrible set up the Aprichnik in 1565. It was the first political police in Russian history. Ivan used the notorious Oprichnik to undermine the influence of the nobility and control the newly emerging trading routes going through Kazan. Anyone or any house that posed even a remote threat was eliminated swiftly and completely. The Oprichnik was so competent in intimidating the populace that later Russian leaders kept employing it. And as Russia's economic center of gravity shifted south and east, the political police, by then reformed and expanded, became indispensable in holding the empire together. From 1551 to 1700, Russia grew by 35,000 square kilometers per year, or one Belgium a year. However, as Russia grew, it made new enemies on all fronts. To the west, there were the Swedes, the Poles, the Prussians and the Germans. While to the south, there were the Turks, the Tatars, the Cossacks and the Caucasian tribes. Russia was extremely vulnerable to a coordinated land invasion, especially since its territory was mostly flat. What followed was a period of total war, where Russia fought rival powers in multiple directions. It was either conquer or be conquered. And while Russia became more secure the bigger it got, an unexpected liability emerged. The new territories to the south and east had widely different ethnic and religious populations who were not loyal to the Tsar. And rival powers repeatedly exploited the fealty of these minorities. So, to incorporate the new territories into the empire, the Russian leadership tried to remake the ethnic religious makeup of the regions through mass deportations, genocides and assimilation programs. Yet even so, Russia was unable to fully erase or pacify the indigenous populations. To mitigate the threat and enforce authority over the new territories, the Russians transformed the political police into a massive security network giving it increasingly more abilities and responsibilities. Whether it was the Prikaz in the 17th century, the Akhrana in the 19th century or the KGB in the 20th century, the intelligence network became an essential component that kept Russia cohesive. Crimes were committed in the name of empire. The only brief exception to Russia's history of oppression was in the 1990s. The last Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and the first Russian president Boris Yeltsin led a process of democratization. The Kremlin relinquished its monopoly on political power and individual Russians took control of their lives. But instead of liberation, a sense of loss came to define the national mindset. The chaotic transformation of the economy, going from a communist command economy to a capitalist free market, left large segments of the Russian population behind. Millions slid into poverty. The situation got so bad that in 1993, a coalition of nationalists and communists rebelled against economic reforms. A constitutional crisis emerged between the president and the parliament. To push his economic reforms, Yeltsin sought to dissolve the parliament. In response, the parliament declared Yeltsin's decision null and void and impeached him. At the same time, the country's self-aware constituent provinces were increasingly pushing for greater sovereignty from the Kremlin. By then, Russia had a few dozen federal subjects, including republics, autonomies and territories, each home to distinct ethnicities. In southern Russia, the tiny region of Chechnya proclaimed outright independence. Things were moving fast, too fast. Anxiety filled the halls of the Kremlin. 
Years earlier, the Soviet Union had disintegrated into 15 republics. Now it seemed that democracy, with its minority rights, was pushing Russia towards another disintegration. No less than 21 republics, 4 autonomies and 9 territories were on the verge of secession, and the existence of Russia was at risk. Seemingly, Russia could turn to democracy, but not in its existing territorial configuration. The choice came down to security and territory versus liberty and prosperity. The Kremlin fell back on its old habits and opted for the former. As such, Yeltsin fortified his executive authority by returning to mass violence as a means of political organization. He shelved the parliament and then ordered the brutal invasion of Chechnya. Yeltsin then left the situation to his hand-picked successor, Putin. Democracy as a political organization was deemed too risky, so Putin invented his own sovereign democracy. The new political system had all the merits of a democracy, including a bicameral parliament, a supreme court and a host of political parties. In practice, however, Putin's system allowed the ruling United Russia Party to take on the role that the Communist Party had once played during the Soviet era. Sovereign democracy appealed to the public's imperial nostalgia because it espoused domination over others, just as historic Russian philosophies had. Haunted by post-imperial phantom pains, the Russian leadership, but also nationalists, communists, Eurasianists, conservatives and even some liberals, believe that Western-style democracy is impossible for Russia. This shared belief is the result of history. To hold the geography from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok necessitates specific responsibilities as notorious as they are. Despotism is therefore arguably part of Russia's geography. But then again, if Russia is sealed to despotism, let it have democracy, for it gives every person the right to be his own oppressor. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Remember to play War Thunder now on PC, PlayStation or Xbox using the link on the screen. Upon registration, you will get a large free bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, premium account, boosters and much more. War Thunder, get it now. Thank you for watching and Sogol.